Good morning. Welcome to Bethel this morning. Good to see everyone here. To uh, begin our time together this morning, I'd like to read Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2. And as I was, uh, as I was looking at this, it kind of reminded me back when I was a kid, I know that uh, the church where I grew up they had officially in the bulletin, in the, in the uh, order of service, a call to worship. And this just reminded me of that. This is a call to worship. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. So as we uh, begin our worship time this morning, Let's stand together, and our first song is number 65, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. If you care to use the hymnals, it's number 65. We'll sing all four verses. song that leads us to prayer time this morning is number 143, I Know Whom I Have Believed, and we will sing verses 1, 3, and 5. <laughs> Redeem me for him. 
shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We come together recognizing you as the great creator, as the one who cares for us, the one who loves us. And so we come together to honor you, to raise up your name. We thank you for the blessings that you give out to us each and every day. We thank you for the ways you protect us and care for us sometimes that we don't even recognize. We know there are many among us who have difficult situations in their lives. They're facing health issues or, or various other problems that, that they're having to confront. And we ask a special blessing on them that they would feel your grace, your comfort, your peace, and your power. That they would know that, that you are caring for them, you are showing them the way. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who you sent to be this perfect sacrifice for our sin debt. And we praise you for all that you've done, allowing us to come back into your presence. We ask your blessing over the rest of this service. May we worship you. May we be instructed. May we learn more about your love and how to share it with others. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Leading us into communion this morning, we'll sing number 164, For God So Loved the World, we'll sing it twice through. This morning as we come around the communion table, the one thing I want you to think about is your attitude. Where's your attitude at right now? I'm going to read from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In other words, God submitted himself to us. Christ died because it was necessary for us to live. Christ's incomprehensible journey from the glory of heaven to a manger in Bethlehem to dying in agony on a cross is a, dis is a distance that cannot be measured even in light years. Jesus made himself nothing so we could have everything. Jesus condensed all his love and sacrifice down to two simple emblems, bread and wine, his body and blood. Communion is our way of stopping each week to ponder anew, anew the staggering price of salvation and check our attitudes. Look at this gift. Look at the humility, the love, the servant heart of Jesus, the one who gave it to us. Each person, each person should consider, has this gift changed how I treat others? 
do I, do I extend the same love and forgiveness I am receiving to someone else? And do I have the same attitude as Christ? And I just want you to think on those things as we go before the Lord this morning and before, as uh, we take communion. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come around this table this morning, I just thank you for allowing us this time. We thank you for the sacrifice that you paid for each one of us on that cross. Father, I just pray that uh, as we, we are at this time that our mindset is focused on you and what you did pay for each one of us. Father, just now I pray that you'd be with each and every one that partakes. For it's in Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Amen.
Good morning. The kids can be dismissed for junior worship. <clears throat> you know, last week I, I mentioned that we are getting some of our, our snowbirds back, some of our southern travelers. Well, and this week, uh, Bob Daft has, has joined us. I, I think Bob said before service it's been 56 Sundays. Uh, so that is, that is incredible. And, and so uh, make sure you, you welcome Bob and, and uh, say hello to him. Uh, it's been it's been quite the year, and I know uh, we're all looking forward to, to getting most of it behind us. So let's go ahead and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we trust you and we thank you. God, we thank you that you are in control, that you are guiding, that you are leading. God, as we come before you this morning, as we open your word, God, I pray that you would speak to us. Help us to see your power at work in our lives. God, remind us. Remind us because we so easily forget. God, take our time together this morning. Use it as you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The opening monologue in the extended version of the Fellowship of the Ring is a, a short history uh, about the ring that the entire series is based on. If you're not familiar with the series, it's from J.R.R. Tolkien, and, and uh, Tolkien, along with C.S. Lewis, were incredible authors and, and drew a lot of comparisons or analogies between the characters and Jesus. And throughout this journey that this story is based on, we can see Jesus coming through in so many different ways. Well, from The Hobbit, which was the first book, all the way through The Return of the King, the characters are all linked through that one ring that J.R.R. Tolkien says would rule them all. Well, in the movie, her history, the, the elf queen Galadriel describes how history has been forgotten. The damage that had been caused was just a faint memory. The damage that had happened because someone had held on to that ring, people had just forgotten. And she said this. She said, some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. History became legend. Legend became myth. And for two and a half thousand years, the ring passed out of all knowledge until when chance came, it ensnared a new bearer. History became legend. Legend became myth. And we begin to forget. We, we begin to not pay attention to what history said. We begin to kind of forget what brought us to the point that we are at. In this epic story, the forgotten truth, leads to the rise of pain and suffering for everyone in the area. Because they had all forgotten the past, that evil was able to rise in power, striking fear into all, especially those who would land on the side of righteousness. In our own lives, our forgetfulness can bring about pain and suffering when we don't remember, when we allow history to just become a legend, and then legend passes into myth. And you can see that as you, as you look at how the world considers Christianity, how history has passed into legend and legend into myth. I mentioned last week that Paul called our attention back to the exodus of the people of Israel out of Egypt. And he reminded us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, now these things happen to them as an example, but they are written down for our instruction. That's not just about the exile, but so many times the nation of Israel had turned their backs on God. They had turned their backs and they had sinned, and within one generation they would forget. They would forget the truth that God is in control. They would forget that God had promised to take care of them. And maybe you even remember a few years ago, we did a, a short study on the book of Judges. 
In the book of Judges, it was a rinse and repeat type scenario. You know, every time they would sin and they would turn away from God and God would raise up somebody else to, to remind them. But then after a period of time, oftentimes within a generation, they would forget. That history would just pass out of their knowledge. And scripture said over and over again that they would do what was right in their own eyes. They stopped paying attention to what God had called them to do. They stopped paying attention to who God had called them to be, and instead they just did what was right in their own eyes. And that rinse and repeat would happen, and God would have to step in once again. And the people would repent and turn, maybe for a short time, maybe for a longer time, but, but eventually they would forget. We need to never forget the painful reminders of the past. But we should also remember that God is faithful in our circumstances. God is faithful in all circumstances. It's easy, I think, for people to forget even important matters. In our fast-paced, information-driven society, of course, the present is closer to mind than the past. I know that sounds kind of, kind of a silly statement. The, the present is closer to mind than the past. Our 24-hour news cycle causes us to get riled up one day, but by the next day, we've forgotten what we're riled up about, and we've got something else to be mad about. We've moved on to something else. Some of us struggle to remember where we dropped our keys when we came into the house much less the struggles that we went through 20 years ago. We forget so easily. And God calls us to remember, and he sets things up for us to remember. Some time ago, I started a file on my computer trying to just remember some of the challenges that we faced when we were looking at houses here when we moved four years ago. <laughs> and I... I and, I want to remember some of these disasters that we walked into. I, I want to remember walking into one and almost losing the realtor through a floor. You know, I, I, I want to remember some of those things because there's going to come a time that we'll forget. There's going to come a time that I won't remember, but it'll be fun to remind my kids and to share with them. Of course, I try to keep track of my family's fiasco of moving from Oklahoma to Ohio 15 years ago, and I revisit that myself every so often just to just a smile, but most importantly to remember how God took care of my family through all of that. How God took care of us despite losing the starter in a Walmart parking lot, despite the fuel filter going out as we were going down the hills into St. Louis, despite the fact that the motorhome would just die as we were driving along, despite the fact that we blew a tire, God was still taking care of us. Despite the fact that we ended up living for six weeks in a motorhome behind the church in the middle of winter beginning November 1st. With four kids, Heidi was pregnant with the fifth, two dogs and a cat. I don't want to forget those things because they're reminders that God is in control. That God has our circumstances and he has been faithful even when I have been faithless. God wants us to remember and he prescribed us ways of worship to help us to do that. For New Testament Christians, he calls us to not neglect meeting together. We're commanded to commemorate the death of Jesus through our time of communion where we take the bread and drink the cup as a physical reminder of his sacrifice. He's even instituted our own baptism as that identifying moment of the new life that he has started in us where we are buried with Christ and raised to walk a new life. These are important reminders because we are a people who easily forget. I mean, I, I, I forget my own kids' names sometimes. There's five of them, so you've got to go through the list sometimes when you're yelling at them, right? And sometimes the dog's name gets thrown in there. And, and so God knew we are a forgetful people, and so he calls us to remember. If you recall in the book of Joshua... God had commanded the Hebrew children to build an altar after they crossed the Jordan. And the purpose of that altar was to remind 
future generations of what had happened in the wilderness to keep them from forgetting. In addition to the altar where they were to worship, God had instituted feasts and festivals to help people remember God's faithfulness throughout history. To this day, Orthodox Jews will tie a small portion of Scripture to their head and to their arms to remember God's law. And they will recite the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 2, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They want to remember. Now, I am not one for returning to some of the Pharisaical laws that were put into place for people to try to force someone to respond. But I think we miss some of the incredible benefits of those regular feasts and festivals as times to remember God's faithfulness even when we're faithless. Even when we just forget all that God has done, he has remained faithful. Here within the restoration movement, I believe we have to be careful to not let this time of weekly communion just become rote remembrances. I think we have to make this a meaningful time where we remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ. His body that was pierced and bruised and torn on that cross. His blood that was spilled for my sins. This is not just a a mid-service snack to keep our blood sugar from dropping too low. This is the time to remember. Allow God to speak into your heart. And in that time, he's going to remind you of sin in your life. But even greater, he's going to remind you of the forgiveness that he offers to all. It sounds simple, but we remember so that we don't forget. Well, this morning, I want to continue in our study in the book of Ezra. And and hopefully, through this this look this morning, we can learn to remember from people that had forgotten what their purpose was. Now, now just as a a recap, a reminder, the the people... A reminder, that's that's kind of funny. I didn't even realize that when I was writing my notes. Uh, The people had returned from Babylon, and, and they had laid the foundation stones of the temple... They got everything ready. It was, it was started. Some of the people rejoiced. Some of the people wept. But then as we looked at last week, Satan stopped that work. After that first stone was laid, after the foundation was laid, Satan stepped in and used the people around them to bring discouragement and frustration. And for 80 years... The people would half-heartedly attempt to work. The people would think about doing the work. But for 80 years, it just sat there with the foundation. And Satan thought he had won. Now, in that time, there were new Hebrew leaders who had stepped in trying to rebuild the temple. They started a little bit more of the work. But those neighbors said, hey, what are you doing? Who gave you that permission? And so they came and they said, who who authorized this? And so they sent word to Babylon. That's actually where we pick up in Ezra chapter 5. And I'm going to start in verse 17. We're going to go through chapter 6, verse 5, and then we're going to jump ahead a couple verses. So Ezra chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, if it seems good to the king, let search be made in the royal archives there in Babylon to see whether a decree was issued by Cyrus the king for the rebuilding of this house of God in Jerusalem and let the king send us his pleasure in this matter. Let me just pause. See, right here, and and, and I know it's hard to realize when we're reading through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 that 80 years has passed since chapter 5 started. But But the people have even forgotten that a decree had been sent from the king. And they were like, well, really, we need to find out about this. And so they send that notice to the king. Chapter 6 is where Darius steps in. Then Darius, the king, made a decree, and search was made in Babylonia, in the house of the archives where the documents were stored. And in Ecbatana, the citadel that is in the province of Media, a scroll was found on which was written. A record in the first year of Cyrus the king. Cyrus the king issued a decree 
concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where sacrifices were offered, and let its foundations be retained. Its height shall be 60 cubits, its breadth 60 cubits, with three layers of great stones and one layer of timber. Let the cost be paid from the royal treasury, and also let the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that is in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be restored and brought back to the temple that is in Jerusalem, each to its place. You shall put them in the house of God. This is their reminder. They had to go back into those storage places and find that first decree. Then jump ahead to verse 19 of chapter 6 here. 19 through the end. On the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean. So they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, for their fellow priests and for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile, and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. Again, pause. I know it might drive you nuts when I stop in the middle. But uh, last week I mentioned that the people who had brought up the charges against the Hebrew people, they had the choice to follow the one true God. All they had to do was separate themselves in that cleanliness. And so here is an example. Those that would separate themselves and identify with the one true God through through circumcision and through obeying God's commands, were welcomed into the nation of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread, verse 22, seven days with joy. For the Lord had made, the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. We need to reclaim what was forgotten. You might have heard that it's never too late to start again. And maybe that's what it felt like for the people of Israel. Eighty years had passed, and, and, and what's the point? Why should they bother? Several years ago, when the economy took a downturn, over in Mansfield, the area was particularly hard hit. And while we were serving at the church there, we lost the General Motors plant just a mile and a half down from the church, countless other small manufacturing businesses. And one of the things that the state tried to do to help those men and women who had been put out of work was to, to try to retrain them, try to help them to start over, try to help them reclaim I knew one gentleman that had been close to retiring as a press operator at, a, at one of the first tier automotive supply companies. And when it went out of business, he had no clue what he was going to do, especially at his age. And he found himself in a college class to learn industrial maintenance. Now he said it was, it was tricky, but one of the things that he said, he said, you can teach an old dog new tricks. You can reclaim what was forgotten. He did say the hardest part to reclaim was algebra. Uh, there had been a long time since he had done anything in algebra. Maybe there is too much truth in the statement that we have forgotten. I can guarantee you, as I look around this room, there are people in this church building that have forgotten more things than I've ever known. There is, there is such cumulative wisdom among the people in this room right now. And you have forgotten more than I have ever learned. This may be a little country church, but I tell you what, I would put you guys up against any of the brains anywhere in this United States. Unfortunately, there are truths that we have forgotten because we've simply gotten out of practice. What's your plan to remember? How do you plan to remember? Because if you don't have a plan, you're going to forget. I, I loved uh, last night at, at uh, dinner, and, and I'll pick on AJ a little bit now because she's not here and she'll smack me if I do it in second service. Um, 
but, but we were having some roasted potatoes, and she had a new sweatshirt on, and she dropped a little bit, and so there was a little bit of grease there. And so all of a sudden, I hear her, and she's looking down. This shirt has grease on it. 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 And I said, what are you doing? She's like, I want to remember to treat it later. <laughs> she had a plan to remember. Now, I don't know if she remembered or not, because there was a lot that happened after that. But she had a plan. And if she didn't make that plan, she didn't stick with that plan, she was going to forget. She understood that. What's your plan to remember? You see, we don't have the festivals and feasts any longer. So what are you going to do? Can I encourage you? You have got to make a plan to get into God's Word daily. Old Testament, New Testament, prophets, poetry, history, doesn't matter. I believe that we forget in part because we don't engage. I believe that we forget what God has in store for us, just like the people of Israel forgot in those 80 years what God had asked them to do. He had asked them to rebuild the temple so that worship could begin, and they forgot. When we will engage with God in his word, then he will step in and help us to reclaim what we have already forgotten. Well, here's the other thing. You can't remember what you don't know already. <laughs> you got to get into God's word to begin with. Too often, I believe we get out of children's Sunday school and we never read these rich stories anymore. We think we know all there is to know about Jonah and that big fish. Or we think we've got it all figured out when it comes to the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, this last week, uh, Heidi was talking with me about an article from David Butts of, of Harvest Prayer Ministries. And he was talking about the story, uh, the parable, right after the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11. Let me go ahead and flip over there real quick. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 5. This is right after Jesus shares, this is how you pray. Luke 11, chapter 5. And he said to them, which of you has a friend who will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receive, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Now, I have always read that story and most often heard those verses taught being about persistence in prayer. That because that neighbor was persistent in asking, hey, I need some bread. No, go away. I need some bread. My children are in bed with me. I need some bread. That we have to be persistent in prayer. See, this is the thing. I don't have it all figured out because as Heidi shared, she said there's more to this account and there is a level of this that is about intercessory prayer or prayer for other people. The friend went and asked his neighbor for bread. Why did he ask his neighbor for bread? Well, because somebody had come on a journey and they needed bread. He has a friend that needs to eat and he has nothing to set before him. A good friend will see that there is someone in need. And he knows who has the resources to meet that need. And so he goes to him. Christian, we have the opportunity to go to God on our neighbor's behalf because he is able to give what we ask. There was a friend who needed bread. And so he was willing to go to a friend that he knew would have him have bread. That friend may not be able to ask on their own, so you and I have got to go to God on their behalf, interceding before him. And then we have to be persistent in that prayer because we know God has all the resources at his disposal. And if we ask him, he can give that good and perfect gift to that friend who is in need. He is able to give exactly what our friends need. 
even when they're not able to ask on their own. We have to intercede on their behalf and ask God to give abundantly. And, and I say that because this is, this is the first time I've ever seen that interpretation of this parable from Scripture. Maybe you've seen it before. Like I said, most of you have forgotten more than I've ever known. But this is the first time. If you think you have it all figured out about Scripture, think again. God has something he wants to teach you. God has something that you can learn. When we go back to Ezra, that original scroll from the king of Babylon had long since been forgotten. They didn't even know where it was. Did you notice? They had to look in several different places to even find it. They had to go deep into the archive to find where those documents were stored, but they found that decree. God had helped them to reclaim what was forgotten. And he wants to help you reclaim what was forgotten. Second truth from this text, I believe, is God never forgets his promises. Even when we forget even when we are faithless, God is faithful. God used a Persian king to remind the people of his promises. He used a godless leader to remind his people that his love never ends. Here's the thing, that, that even as I'm, I was reading through it again this morning, it stuck out to me, God even used those who were standing in opposition to the work of the temple for the temple work to re be resumed. You remember, it was those who were in opposition who came and said, hey, who gave you the right to do this? They were like, well, a long time ago. And so they sought out the truth. Isn't it fascinating how God will even though, use those who stand in opposition to the truth to reclaim what was forgotten? That's just the way our God works. He is faithful even when we are faithless. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. It doesn't matter how long you think you've forgotten. You are never too far gone. The temple would be started again, but that doesn't mean they'd always remember. They'd forget again, just like the judges, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. God made promises that he will never forget. Even as we forget, he made promises that we now understand lead up to the coming of Jesus Christ. That there would be a day, as Jesus talked to that woman at the well, there would be a day when true worshipers would worship in spirit and in truth, not just on that mountain in Jerusalem. Today, through this text, God is, is using a Persian king to remind us, but he's not going to use a Persian king to remind us about his word anymore. Here's the great thing about being New Testament Christians. God is going to use his Holy Spirit that dwells in each believer to bring to mind God's word. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14 that the Holy Spirit would lead them into all truth and bring to mind what he had taught them. The verse says, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. God never forgets his promises, and he will remind you when you need him to. <laughs> his Holy Spirit is there to teach and to remind you, to convict you of sin, but also to remind you of those things that you think you've forgotten from his word. Now, now, to be clear, we have a role in this as well. The Holy Spirit is, is indwelling in each one of, of, of each one of the children of God, each believer. But that doesn't mean that suddenly you're just going to know all of what Scripture says. You've got a role to play in this. Mark Moore talks about a young man that showed up at Ozark Christian College ready to enroll in classes. He was ready to be a preacher, and this was... This was before everyone had a, a computer in their pocket. And so class registration and matriculation was, was an all-day event. I mean, you, you got into line at 8 o'clock in the morning. You were lucky if you were carrying your books out at 5 p.m. You know, you were just exhausted. And so it's an all-day event. You went from table to table, taking care of all the details. 
you would get your dorm assignment, you would find out what your class was. One, one of those tables you would come to was your advisor. And they'd walk you through what classes you had to take. Incoming freshmen at Ozark were required to take several classes, English and speech. But every student there double majors in Bible. And so every freshman has to take Old Testament history, Acts, Life of Christ, Christ and the Bible. I mean, that's guaranteed every freshman has to take those and more. This young man stopped at Mark's table, and he said, I'm, I'm ready to be a preacher, but I don't want to take any Bible classes. I just want to take the classes that teach me how to be a preacher. And, and Mark looked at him, he said, why, why are you at Bible college? He said that the Holy Spirit would teach him everything he needed to know about the Bible. Well, needless to say, this young man didn't last at Ozark because they did require him to sign up to take all those Bible classes. Everyone has to take those Bible classes. Here's the thing. Sometimes we think it's kind of like, you know, the the young man who who puts his his textbook underneath his pillow and goes to sleep. I was on the books all night. (laughs) We think we we can, you know, just kind of hold it close to us and, and we'll get it figured out. You have a role to play in this. Yes, God's Holy Spirit is dwelling in you, but we need to be in God's Word so that He can remind us of that. We should be memorizing His Word. We should be holding it in our hearts so that at just the right time, God's Holy Spirit can do that job, can remind us of those words that we have learned. I believe that's one of the greatest tasks of God's Holy Spirit. Yes, to convict us of our own sin so that we can repent. But one of the greatest tasks is to remind us of Scripture when we need it or when someone else needs it. I love how many times, like I'll be sitting and talking with someone, and I, I, don't, I don't have a clue what to say. I mean, I, I, somebody, somebody can be sharing and I'm just like, okay, God, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> help and as we're sitting there uh, a scripture comes back to mind that's not me that's God's Holy Spirit at work but I've got to be in the word first we're going to be reminded but it's going to be based on what you have already read what you have memorized what you have studied do you have a plan to remember because if you don't you're just gonna forget and it's going to move into legend and then myth. Myth. We must be intentional about remembering. Many friends of mine have tattoos as a permanent reminder of certain events in their life. Can I encourage you to have God's Word so etched into your soul that they serve as permanent reminders of God's faithfulness? so etched into your soul that in those times of struggles, you can call back to what God has promised to you. So etched into your soul that when somebody else comes to you with a struggle, you can call back to what God has already taught you. Even in a monumental task like rebuilding the temple, the Hebrew people forgot. I mean, you would think it's right there, the foundation is laid. What do you need to remember to do that? And yet they forgot. They forgot what God had sent them to do. They forgot God's faithfulness in sending them out of Babylon and back into Israel. They forgot the task that was right in front of them. But God is in the business of restoring and reminding. Can I offer a last word as we close this morning? God's grace is big enough. God's grace was big enough to continue to forgive even when the nation of Israel would forget. And God continues to offer that grace to you today. He continues to offer grace to each and every one of us. He didn't just offer that grace to Israel, but he offers it to you. Maybe this morning you haven't even experienced his grace yet, but he still offers it to you. Maybe you're here this morning and and you're sitting in in that state of forgetfulness. You don't even know what you're supposed to remember anymore. 
God says, let me remind you. God says, let me remind you of my faithfulness. Let me remind you of my promises to never leave you, to never forsake you. Maybe you're, you've forgotten the grace that God had on you. You've forgotten the mercy that he's shown to you. He wants to remind you. Maybe you're here this morning and you need that, that act of baptism to remind you of that new life that you walked in. Maybe this morning you needed this time of communion as that reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for your sins. Today, whatever it is, God invites you to respond. He invites you to remember this is your reminder to, to follow him, to recognize his faithfulness even when we're faithless. Will you stand with me as we sing together this morning and as we make that commitment to be a people who remember, to not let history dissolve into myth. Will you sing with me? you talking here. Um, just want to remind you of a couple of announcements. If you have a graduate in your family, either high school or college, please get that information to the uh, office by May 15th. We want to honor our graduates, so please take care of that. And also remember that it is fast coming on church camp uh, season. And so get your kids enrolled in church camp and also the camp donations that uh, we were to, the, the cards out in the foyer, get those donations back by Sunday, May 16th. You good? Yeah. Uh, go ahead and give me. Gary, let me have you turn and, and face everybody here. Uh, this, is, this is Gary Cornell. And uh, Gary Cornell comes this morning and not as, as something new, but <laughs> as something that was once forgotten. Uh, and, and this morning he comes, he's, he's asked to rededicate his life to Jesus Christ. Uh, something has been forgotten, but, but he remembers. He's been reminded, and, and Dell has walked through him with a lot of this and has stood by him and, and has been praying for him. Uh, we prayed for Gary a while back. He had a, a major brain surgery Dell had asked us to pray for. Uh, I, think, I think he was up at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and, and so this was, this was some time ago, uh, but we've, we've been praying for Gary. I told him Dell's not the only one that's been praying for him. And so this morning he comes uh, as that recommitment, uh, as that uh, reminder, or receiving that reminder, that commitment to remember that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pray. Who was supposed to close in prayer? Mark Moss, I'm taking over. <laughs> I'm just going gonna, gonna to pray over Gary and, and just pray to close our service this morning. Will you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much. I thank you for each one of us receiving the reminder that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. God, that you ask us to remember, and this morning you have been working in Gary's life. And God, he has remembered your faithfulness. He has remembered your grace and your mercy, and today he commits to living that life in remembrance, to living his life for Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for those who have been faithful in praying for Gary. I thank you for, for Dell's commitment to him. I thank you for people who have, have committed to prayer for him. And God, as each one of us go from this place, I ask that we would remember your faithfulness, that each of us would commit anew, would recommit to following Jesus Christ with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God, I pray a blessing over each person here. I pray a blessing over Gary. God, that you would bless and keep him and make your face to shine upon him and be gracious to him. God, give him your peace. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.